Hello everyone, you're listening to Dub Lab Radio. This is your host Ale here on Elevation Through Sound. And uh, today, really honored, really happy and excited to have two very special guests uh, to me in conversation. We have uh, Jared Ar- Arto, Arto, sorry, and uh, Liz Lamir. Uh, I uh, hope I'm pronouncing your names correctly. Close enough. Close enough. I'm actually Lamarie. Lamarie. Fantastic, fantastic. And hello, Jared, uh, and, and both of you, Liz and Jared, thank you so much for joining today. And um, uh, thank you so much for taking some time to talk about uh, the work of uh, Alan Vega um, and then uh, the, the latest record, Mutator, that uh, uh, you two work together on, and, uh, and even hopefully more. Uh, so it's wonderful to have you here. Thanks for having us. Good to be yes. here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for, for those um, uh, out there trying to get familiar with, uh, with the new work with Mutator, maybe let's, let's start with that. There's, there's so much we can talk about here, obviously. But uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, Mutator, that is a, a work that uh, you two collaborated on in producing and, uh, and came out recently, right, on Sacred Bones? Yes, um, Mutator was actually an album that Alan and I had recorded the music for back in the mid 90s. And then Jared and I had discovered the, the ADAT tapes um, for in 2019. And we collaborated on producing and mixing the album. Jared, do you want to speak to the, there's a whole backstory. Yeah, there's a whole backstory. You? Yeah. It was actually it was actually pretty amazing. We uh, I Liz called me and was like, I think you have to come over. I um, so I lived uh, like I lived one stop away from uh, from Alan and Liz uh, in Brooklyn. You know, I hop over the East River and be over to their apartment in like twenty minutes, um, and got really close to Alan uh, before he died. So I had done that um, prior to discovering Mutator with Liz, and she called me and said, "Come, you have to come over here. I found something." And we discovered these tapes, these ADAT tapes, and um, we knew there was something special. We just had no idea what was on those tapes. Um, so we um, got my close friend and longtime engineer, Ted Young, uh, to transfer those tapes. And when we opened them up um, and got them into the digital zone, it was like a flash memory for Liz and she remembered these songs. And it was from that moment where we were disco- discovering what that cluster of material was, um, which kind of launched Liz back into the it mid nineties, like 95, 96. It was period. crazy. Yeah. Literally I felt Alan's presence. We both had chills. Um, and I could hear even even tracks. I can almost remember because I was playing the machines then. I had been recording albums with Alan uh, since the late '80s, early '90s when we did du- uh, Deuce Avenue together, and we did a few solo albums, and then we did Du Jang Prang. Henry Rollins had come to New York and had started a record label, and prior to Du Jang Prang, we would sometimes spend two or three years just working on creating sounds and experimenting with sounds. And to put it into context, when I met Alan, he was just coming off Electra Records where everything was really produced. You had the top producers and you're bringing in songwriters and all of this kind of of thing. And at the same time, he was living at the Gramercy Park Hotel and experimenting with sounds Um, and uh, linking together guitar pedals and had rhythm machines and just creating crazy sounds. So we started going into the recording studio together. And because I had been a drummer in bands, Alan said to me, well, you've got a great sense of rhythm. We can start just creating sounds together and layering sounds and, and that sort of thing. So we would often spend two or three years creating an album and there would be two, 20 or 30 quote, air quote, songs, and I would say, let's put out, let's release an album, let's, you know, and then Alan would kind of focus in on the 10, nine or 10 songs that felt like they were uh, holistically a conceptual whole, and then he would write lyrics, and then the music would be done. He would go into the vocal studio and do the vocal takes for the entire album in basically one session, one take, that sort of thing. Sometimes it'd do more, yeah, it was incredible. 
Um, but because of that process for each album we recorded and released, there would be 10 or 20 or 30 songs in, in some instances that weren't left behind because he didn't like them. It just, that was just the process. So after Do Jang Prang, which we did relatively quickly, we started working on the songs that became Mutator. So there was a conceptual hole and there were songs that were kind of a cluster, but we had, he had gone in, he had recorded the vocals, but we hadn't, he for some reason hadn't decided that it was finished musically. He was experimenting and he was, the sounds were evolving that he was working on. So he wanted to go back and revisit the music. So he did that. So it was actually, one step further but we hadn't mixed the album when i for personal reasons couldn't go come into the studio for a while and he started working on other tracks that became the next released album which was 2007. so when we discovered this and we start playing them i'm having these i'm like holy <laughs> shit, <we're having> <laughs> yeah, oh, it came to it came to my whole period of your life uh probably came to mind right all Absolutely. of a sudden i felt like i was right back there and and jared knowing alan really well he was getting chills too and the, the other thing that's interesting about it is by that time, Jared had gotten very close to Alan, but the initial impetus for that was Jared had reached out on behalf of himself and, and his partner, Brian, the band, The Vacant Lots. They had covered a Vegas song. And Jared, maybe you, could, you can speak to that because it's a really interesting story how the three of us connected. That, that, yeah, was, that was going to be my question, actually. How, how did that relationship come about? Um, and uh, and how you guys met and how not just met but because uh, just like anyone Alan probably met lots of people but how you how you guys connected uh, in a in, to that other level uh, that uh, led to creative uh, collaborations. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was the the ultimate. I um we were asked to be part of this Christmas album compilation that Iggy Pop and Psychic Ills and some other bands that we really liked were part of, and I remember just going, "Yeah, we'll do it," and then looked to brian and my bandmate and said what the fuck song are we gonna like what christmas song are we gonna cover <laughs> um and uh so after like perusing through the list of traditional christmas songs and almost bailing on the project um i had done a little bit of research and kind of went through you know this kind of crazy record searching uh searching for any christmas song that just didn't sound like a christmas song and discovered the z christmas record uh, from 1981 and there was a song on there no more christmas blues um by alan and it blew me away it was like so depressing and sad and just like uh it, it was like a charles bukowski poem like come to life you know mm -hmm. on christmas and it reminded me of like johnny ace who like shot, blew his brains out on christmas and it was i was like i fucking love this it's like everything i think christmas is is like i know it's like really fucked up to say but um it really resonated with me and um and the song was just incredible and so we just kind of decided to cover that and just kind of flip it and give it more of like a, a dance beat and, um, and, and, and put a little bit of a spin on it. And I sent it to Liz. So we were like Facebook friends and um, I sent her a message and just, you know, said to her how out of appreciation, you know, t to Alan, I mean, he really inspired me and his work, I mean, continues to inspire me and is, you know, res a largely responsible for, you know, our development as a band. And, um, you know, and also, you know, kind of prefaced it with, you know, hope, you know, he doesn't think we butchered his track <laughs> and uh, just to kind of protect myself and, um, and not expecting anything in return other than to just say thanks. You know, I've never, I think one thing for me that's really been important in my development as an artist is to never be afraid to reach out to other artists who've inspired you, um, even if it's just to say thanks or to collaborate with them. And, um, and surprisingly, Liz, you know, I think she was like out, like out and about. And she, she was like, I'll play it for Alan when I get home. When I get and home. Later that, yep. <laughs> yeah. And, and later that day. if I can interject, because yeah, yeah. There was some, I didn't know the vacant lots, but there was just something about the way Jared approached me that I'm like, I, you know, I, I'm curious to hear this track. And so I waited to listen, you know, I, I brought it home. And if I may, Jared, I can yeah, tell yeah, for sure. as you can imagine, a lot of people would send Alan things and, um, you know, he, 
I played this track for Alan and he immediately was, who is this? Da, 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 da. Like when, where are they? When can we meet them? This kind of like, he, it was, they brought something to this that you can't even put your finger on what it was about it, but it just really resonated with Alan. And there was a certain soulfulness or, or whatever it was. And by happenstance, they were on tour with, I guess it was Dean Wareham. Yeah. So when, when I reached out to Jared to tell him that Alan yeah. didn't meet him, they happened to be like, and he's like, can we have them over for brunch? And <laughs> it was so bizarre because Alan never invited me. It was, it was <laughs> so interesting. So Jared, you can take it from here. Yeah, so it was incredible. Like we, um, so first of all, like I said to Brian, like, hey, do you want to have brunch with Alan Vega and Liz Lamoree? And uh, Brian's like, what? Um, just the, you know, just knowing that I think, you know, that, that Alan and Liz listened to it was just, I mean, it was like the ultimate, you know? So I remember, uh, so it was a couple hours before sound check and uh, we were doing a show at Bowery Ballroom with Dean Wareham and we're on our way over to, to their apartment and we park. Um, I even think, I don't even think I told you Liz, but I think I got a parking ticket because there was like no parking. I was like, fuck yeah, it. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're yeah. meeting the king of, of fucking punk. And um, so he parked her car and uh, we're up, you're going up the elevator. I'm like sweating and really nervous. And I, I think like Alan's going to come to the fucking door with like a chainsaw or some shit, you know, <laughs> exactly. like with a leather jacket and a fucking chainsaw. It's like, come in, motherfucker. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, you I want hush from <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, Brian, you go first. You know? Yeah, right. Let let him meet you first. And uh, so we walk in and it was like, I mean, he was the nicest, coolest, funniest, smartest, just like, I also felt like I, I've, I've known him forever. He just put off this like a, immense uh, generosity and, hit, and uh, made his time so available. Like there was nothing else but the time he was spending with you. And it, re it just like, it, it was beyond comfortable. It just made... You know, it really, um, you know, Alan had a way of, you know, um, not making it all about himself. Even when you wanted to know everything, you know, like I wanted to interview him and, you know, talk about suicide and his solo records and, you know. It would be um, all about you, right, Jared? Because exactly. Well, but about Alan, he was very generous of spirit. He, he saw yeah. something in this and heard something and he was so interested in nurturing it and being a mentor because it's like, this is the future. This is the next generation. I, they're doing something. They, there's something there. And he would say about Jared, he just gets it because they could talk about, I mean, you guys started doing a deep dive. It reminded me of when he first met Henry Rollins. They were often yeah. running about philosophy and jazz musicians and like all kinds of relatively obscure stuff that, but there was such a, such an interest in nurturing the next generation. Alan was very, a lot of artists have big egos and they're, they're almost threatened by, you know, what are these people yeah. doing? I'm not doing kind of thing. It was quite the opposite with him. He, he, he loved that. So yeah, the, uh, yeah, that was a big part of the connection right away. And, and when it comes to, to, uh, to Alan, um, it, it strikes me that that uh, when when you say things uh, such as well, he wasn't making it about himself. Uh, it probably uh, um, correct me, Liz, if, I, if I'm wrong, but but I can imagine someone that was still hungry for for new ideas, someone that he was getting as much out of this as as uh, Jerry was getting. He like, he wanted to know more about it. He just well, what's well, out there. I mean, uh, uh, he wanted to kind of discover what's uh, what's new, maybe, and then and. and continue the exploration, maybe? Uh, Alejandro, that's an interesting per, um, observation. But in this case, Alan was not, it was very unique in that regard. He didn't listen to a lot of other music. What he heard was, this is talent and I want to I want to encourage them to not get discouraged because the music business can be very difficult. But he didn't need to glean ideas from other, it's, it was really interesting because he always wanted to find something he hadn't heard before. And I think that's one of the things that also set Alan apart as extremely unique. And that might be why he wasn't quote commercial because he wasn't trying to emulate things that were commercial or that popular or anything like that. In fact, if he had heard something before, he would move in another direction. But what he, what resonated with him about them is they didn't just take my thing and try to you know, copy it or whatever. They made it their own. 
And what they did as their own was so unique and interesting that I want to I want to encourage them to keep going because they are very creative in their own lane, doing what they do. So it was more about that. And that's when I talk about generosity of spirit and not feeling competitive because he was only competing with himself to find new things. Mm -hmm. Really, honestly, he didn't listen to a lot of what was happening at, of the moment, other than rap and hip hop, he loved hearing what was happening in the streets yes. and that the sounds they were creating. But again, that didn't inspire him to think, how are they getting that sound? Because I want to get that sound. It inspired him to be like, wow, they're breaking new ground. I got to break new ground too. Like, and where can I find that? And oh, seriously, he yes. used to joke with me because I had more of a pop, a little bit more of a pop sensibility, you know, melody lines and whatnot. But if he had heard something that he thought he had heard before, he would need to pivot away from it, which was really interesting. So it was more about nurturing and encouraging something that he thought they're on to something. They're doing something really good. And he knew how difficult it was to, to, and, and, and at the time, right, Jared, I mean, you guys were mm -hmm. really kind of just, just starting to get some traction and, and, and get to be known in, in, in the business. So it was, yeah, I mean, when they asked us to collaborate. Alan loved that idea. Yeah. And yeah. It was awesome. We just put out our first record and, you know, you guys, um, and, you know, Alan generously like remixed a song and we did a split 10 inch together. And then on our second album, um, you know, Alan's vocals are on the last track. And yep. yeah, so it's just through collaboration. Um, well, it's know, interesting yeah. with, this, with the it's, split tenant. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Alan. No, go ahead. No, yeah, and 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 on the other on 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 the other end of the spectrum, when we talk about uh, new influences uh, versus the other end, which would be were there artists, were there sounds, were there a handful of songs that were his his recurrent inspiration, those things that yeah. he just never walked away from. That is that is what held his musical DNA, you know, those those five songs that he discovered when he was 10 that he just never left behind. Or what was there any such thing absolutely, there? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the soulfulness of, you know, early on it was Elvis or Roy Orbison or um uh Jared, he probably discussed this with you, but it was, it tended to be that roots rock and roll, the real jazz guys, Eric Dolphy and Albert Eiler, um, Coltrane, Coltrane, Fred Sanders. Yeah, exactly. Um, classical music, Tchaikovsky, Mozart. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he loved listening to classical music. So again, it wasn't necessarily like his contemporaries. It was really the stuff that was really hardwired into him. And the common theme was, which is interesting because when you're working with electronic music, it can be very sterile. But Alan, made, he brought the blood and the guts in, and the sexuality into it through, again, um, mm -hmm. those early influences that really stayed with him yes. throughout. And he wasn't trying to emulate their sound, but their energy and their feeling is what I think really inspired him. Yes, mm -hmm. and and you were talking about uh, the idea of, of Alan um, in a way, I don't know if, if the, the idea is like flirting with or, or struggling with finding a balance between his artistic ambitions and, and, and fame, the idea of uh, mm -hmm. uh, pop stardom or pop music and, and just doing his thing and experimenting. And you were saying earlier today when he was with Elektra, uh, it was all about production, it about uh, polishing a product, while at mm -hmm. the same time he was uh, living in, in a hotel room, right? And he was experimenting with sound right at the same time that he would he would have been uh, in a period of polishing this, this pop persona maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. So it sounds to me that th there was a back and forth on, 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 on what his ambitions were on one end and what the other ambitions were on the other end. Well, can I just actually add something to that? I think, it, you know, for me, like first and foremost, uh, like with Alan, he lived and breathed art. You know, he, like I've always, you know, I don't really put him although he is part of the lineage of like, you know, Elvis, you know, Prince, David Bowie, you know, Alan Vega, he's such an icon and such a, you know, legendary musical figure, but he's really like a visual artist working in sound, at least in my perspective, mm -hmm. you know, that it was, you know, it was the art first and not the ambition or the like the networking or the like, I'm going to get famous. Um, you know, he seems so concentrated and focused on the craft of what he was doing versus the ambition or the aspiration to fame, 
Yes, that, 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 was, that, was, that was my question. Uh, yes. uh, were there two sides to it? Or yes. there was, um, uh, you know, because sometimes you hear it in, in artists that are that struggle between the, the, the material and the spiritual kind of thing. Right. I, I love this question because it really gets to the heart of who Alan was as a person. And we used to joke that he was the reluctant rock star because he had... He was that diamond in the rough that they could see, you know, the big machine could see how they could polish him up and, and plug him in. But at the same time, he was afraid that that was taking away his soul. And that's why he had to go back and still experiment, even though they're trying to polish him up and, and put him out there. I think for him, he used to joke and say, I was, I'm, the, I'm the research scientist in the basement. He didn't want to have to be out on the big stage. And yet part of him liked the fact that there was an appreciation for what he was doing because that might enable him to keep doing more. But he was not materialistic at all. He wasn't, you know, in today's world, the whole rock, uh, uh, rock star mentality of you, know, you need to like have all the, you know, toys and, and look really slick and all this, you know, the signs of success, the traditional signs of success. As he got older, he had less and less interest in, in that. It was really about creating music and art. And he started out as a visual artist. So what Jared said before about him, um, you know, Jared has called him an architect of sound or he's at literally sculpting the sound. So he had that 3D, uh, he, he did sculptures. So he literally would be sculpting sound. And for him, that was always the driver. It was always about creating the fame and the commercial success. It was more, a question of then being able to facilitate still doing it, still being able to do it, um, pay the bills, uh, you know, encourage other people, that sort of thing. But I don't, yeah. Uh, no, and it's important when you say, when you say the phrase, uh, paying the bills, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that will uh, take any artist that is, is, is trying or, or does uh, make a living out of this, um, there is always that, you know, there's ne right. next, next month's bills, you know, you have to pay right. them. And, uh, and, and when you uh, are um, on this uh, trajectory that is uh, so personal, that it's just so about your vision, uh, like Alan, you know, that that wasn't on the side composing for films or for TV or producing and, and doing all these other things to pay the bills. Um, mm -hmm. What, what were the, the day to day, um, uh, struggles or what were the day, the day to day routines that he kept to to stay creative to to stick to his guns in a way did he yeah. have uh, uh, daily things that kept it going that's that's a great question uh, the first first and foremost he used to say again and I love quoting him because these I think speak to his ethos I could live in a refrigerator box on the Bowery. <laughs> uh, he also, right. It, he was also fortunate to be partnered with me because I did have a day job. Um, so that helped. But even if he wasn't with me, he would have lived in a refrigerator box in the Bowery to do to be able to focus on his thing. Um, if, and again, if somebody asked him to do sound for a film, he wouldn't be averse to doing that. He did. He did a soundtrack for um, Philippe Grandjour, a, a film out of a French filmmaker. A uh, movie about a serial killer, Sombre, yeah. and he reached out to us and said, "I'm I'm inspiring or uh, motivating my act lead actor to get in the right mindset by playing your music." <laughs> 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 Alan loved. He loved that. That was great. Then, yeah. So he said. So we asked to license some stuff, and then we floated the idea of you know what about Alan just doing some music for the film. He ended up doing the soundtrack. That was one of his favorite things that he ever did. I mean, he absolutely loved doing that. Have um, you heard that, man? I, I haven't, really actually. I, I wasn't familiar with you that. You should check, check mm -hmm. it out. It's really cool. Great. And when Alan first, you know, he was married for 10 years and a very domesticated, and, you know, he loved his first wife. But after he saw Iggy, he was saying to himself, if I want to be true to myself as an artist, and he was pa mostly painting then. Although he had always, even in the 60s, he was walking around recording sounds in the street and playing with electronic machines and recording the sounds that the machines were making. Like just getting static on the on the transistor radio or turning, you know, turning, just make, creating sounds. So he was doing that early on before he thought of himself as a musician. 
But then he sees Iggy and he decides if I'm going to be true to myself, I real as an artist, I need to get out of my comfort zone. So he had been working for the welfare department early on and as, as his day job when he was married. And this was between 60 and 1960 and 1970 after he graduated from college where he started as an astrophysics major. So he's really bright in science and math. And, but it was always doodling when he was growing up, he was always doodling and, um, he was doodling in one of the case books or textbooks and the head of the math department happened to come by and, and said, what is your major? Looking at what he was drawing. And he said, it's physics. He said, it should be art. And so he said, you know what? I'm going to, and he did, he transferred his major to art. So, but he was studying painting. So he goes and gets, goes into Manhattan and basically got funding from the New York state arts council to open this building. And he was going to be supposedly the janitor. And it was a place like, like, um, uh, Andy Warhol's factory where people could just come drop in, do art, music, whatever. Um, Alan didn't have a job. He didn't really have, I think they paid him a very small stipend. He's eating day old bread behind the bakery. You know, he really was literally, he's pulling in things that people had thrown away. Cause at this point he's doing paintings, but at one stage he put a light on the paintings, walking back and forth across this painting and saying, depending on the light, that I'm looking at, it's either purple or black. or And so he puts a light on the painting and he says, hmm, maybe I should be doing sculptures. And then he just starts bringing in garbage that people had thrown away, but interesting things, maybe electronic computers or old TVs. And then he gets wires and piles of lights and he starts putting them on the floor. And then Ivan Karp, who had discovered Andy Warhol, comes into this building to see who the artists are. And a lot of the visual artists are going up and down the strip in Soho with their slides of their work, trying to get gallery shows. And Alan, again, razor like focused on just creating, not even thinking about I'm going to go get gallery shows. Ivan Karp walks in and says, how soon can you be ready for, for an exhibition, a one man show? <laughs> So this was his whole career was like that. It wasn't about let me go hustle for work. It was like I can survive off the street. If I need to go get the bakery bread, I'm fine. He was skinny as a rail, you know, and seriously, because it was literally all. And I saw the way he lived when he lived with me. And it's interesting because it was all about he'd get up. He'd be drawing, he'd be writing, he'd be pulling the stuff he pulled into the street, he'd be con configuring into sculptures and then we'd be in the studio two or three nights a week and he'd be working on music. And it was just, that was it. He wasn't thinking we got to get this gig or we got to do it. In fact, as his manager, I used to joke because people would approach him and they'd say, oh, can you come do this show or whatever? And I would get him to agree. He was always say no at first. And the guy <laughs> the would say, oh my God, he's so unmanageable. It's really difficult because he was the kind of person that would, vent he would he would let you know what he was thinking or feeling in the moment and then he'd be like totally relaxed and cool and that's why we scare the shit out of people sometimes <laughs> need that. it was really just him venting because he had angst and he wanted to don't distract me i'm trying to do this thing I, and so people I'm sorry go ahead no no go ahead go ahead sorry i get excited i just get excited um yeah. so we used to joke that he would i would be the one i wouldn't take no for an answer because that's just my personality well why i want to understand why so then he would agree to something and then sure enough, by the time it came to do it, and it might be a show where he's getting paid a good amount of money. You gotta get this thing. I'm like, what the hell are you already great? <laughs> and then he would go be perfectly gracious and charming and enjoy it. But he would have a little bit of, and he used to say that about Elvis. Elvis used to say, if I wasn't nervous before going on stage, then I shouldn't be going out there anymore. And Alan was like that. He'd get like, and maybe that's because he would have axes thrown at his head when he was touring with The Clash. So he had a little bit of, anxiety before going out on stage. But that's another interesting aspect in terms of the personality that Marty as, as suicide, Marty and Alan believed so strongly that they were breaking new ground and what they were doing should be heard and that they, they loved it. They thought this is great. They couldn't understand why people are like, this is awful or, or just crazy, you know? And then when people would have this crazy adverse reaction, and be throwing stuff at them. Alan figured, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to make them think that I'm crazier than they are. How could I be afraid of you throwing stuff at me when I'm breaking bottles and cutting my face open? And that's what he would do literally to scare them Jesus. into thinking, oh, this guy's a lunatic. I I <laughs> I, I had the opportunity to to meet briefly uh Mar Martin Rev once in the backstage when he played here at, uh, in Los Angeles at Zebulon. And uh I just couldn't believe the, the warmth and, and sweetness that came out of him when I met him after doing this crazy, crazy, really intense show. And, and, and yes, in a way, uh, you take it as, um, 
uh, it becomes your art form, right? But that's not who yeah. you are. That's just right. it's a different thing. I mean, similar to uh, Jared, what you were saying before meeting him, you think he's going to come with a chainsaw uh, to mm -hmm. cut the hash brown uh, during a uh, <laughs> brunch, you know? Uh, but uh, it, it strikes me as as someone that was just like his his main uh, his main uh, drive, his main. Um, uh, uh, not, the words not struggle. He, his his main purpose was to remain uh, surrounded by a creative life, right? A, a, a life of creativity, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 the rest would kind of work itself out in a way. Yes, yes. And he was willing to take whatever it required. Yeah. There was no compromise. Um, there was no compromise in terms of the stage performances with Suicide, where they were willing to go out there and literally put their lives on the line, especially Alan, because he was in the front line of fire. Yes. And he said, I, we, I believe so strongly in what I was doing that let, you know, come at me, throw a knife at me, throw an ax at me. And I'm willing to, to stand up and stand by what I'm doing. I also at, like what you asked before about like, how did he, um, in terms of dealing with some of the struggles for him, it was, it was the drawing and the writing. So every night, like clockwork, like when you asked about his day-to-day -day routine, yes. every single night at the end of the night, um, he would sit and he would do portrait drawings and then he would do his writing and it would be stream of consciousness stuff. He liked doing that way more than when, when there was an album and it's like, okay, now I have to come up with set lyrics. But what he would do is he would go to those writings and we have stacks and stacks of his writings of poetry and stream of consciousness and prose and just thoughts yes. and the, the portrait drawings that was how he got out his he is it was a catharsis for him to, to me i always uh, see creativity as a muscle that you need to to exercise uh, yeah. just like if you were an athlete you need to work out you need to train and I um, and i always see it that way and and you don't go from like from from nothing from you know doing whatever working or do day to day stuff to recording a full album? You need to daily uh, stay in shape creatively, mm -hmm. and 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 these are the things probably that he did. Uh, they were may maybe not meant to be a final product. They weren't meant to be a final piece. They were just his way to working that muscle in in mm -hmm. a way. Um, strikes me out. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, things I just wanted sorry. to interject. Uh, sorry, it's okay. That's a really beautiful analogy that you have um, for yourself too. I also think. Though with Alan and, and some other artists, I can relate to this too. It's it's not only just a muscle because there's like a spiritual element to it. You know, there's like the heart and spirit. You know, it, it's this kind of thing that you tap into that goes beyond your flesh and your muscles. Um, and I think Alan, more than anyone I've ever met, was really tapped into this kind of universal. Um, I, I you know I've discovered it in like poetry, like Rambeau, for example. Um, you know, uh, Jim Morrison and the Doors were kind of getting into that zone, but it seemed like Alan was really tapped into this kind of like universal thing or, or, or universal mind or method. Um, yes. Like, you know, you're not just, you know, you're not just tapped into the shit that goes on on earth, but mm -hmm. the things that go out in space. And yes. there's it's freaky because, yeah. Yeah. And, and with electricity, there's no muscle, but there's electricity. It's invisible, but it's, you know, it, it's there. Um, and I think that there's an aspect of the art process that relies on on that, on intuition and instinct, and not so much on physical strength. Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed like Alan, more than you know anyone I've really ever met, was really in tune with that. And I think part of what drove him creatively wasn't so much in the kind of exercise of it, but more to what Liz was saying in terms of the kind of like spiritual of uh, of the work and where that would lead to and what he would leave behind and what he was connected to and how he can connect to other people with, whether that's on earth and in space and everything in between. If that's, that makes sense, no, not in a metaphysical way, but in a right. kind of like personally spiritual but connecting with other people universally and and yeah. and that that is that that's correct that it strikes me as as you know at, at times you were saying liz that uh, after a suicide show uh he would come out of stage and saying how can no one like this how come this is something that you know we think is the groundbreaking and uh and in trying to to connect to 
to the future present uh, the past present future of of of, of, of creativity uh, was there a sense of vindication that 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 he had over the years did he feel that he fulfilled that mission did he feel that he was part of that that as, as yeah. Jerry just said that 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 um, that continuum that that um, um, legacy right that 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 cosmic conversation that happens among generations of creative people that connect on earth and maybe beyond I love this I love this because this does tap into I believe what what Alan was feeling and experiencing on this plane and what what Jared said about the electricity um, it's no surprise that he became a light artist I think that the he used to say to me that that music is about the movement of sound through time and just and the music that he created was timeless because as Jared indicated, he was yeah. tapping into universal themes somehow that go beyond mm -hmm. the day to day mundane existence or what's happening in our world at this moment in time. It's almost like that collective unconscious um, or the, you know, he was tapping into spirit guides. I, when he when he was getting to the point where he knew he was passing over to the next realm, he was drawing faces. He had done portrait drawings for decades and decades and decades. Now the portraits didn't have faces, which was really interesting. And then he went back to painting. He hadn't painted in quite a while. And he was doing these paintings, again, without faces. And the 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 spirits, which I called them spirits, and he, he was like, yeah. And they were really from different, this one guy that looks like he's from medieval times. And then there's somebody else who's in another period in time. It's really, really interesting that the last series of paintings he did, and there were seven of them, um, but he also, um, I'm sorry, this, I, I just, I just lo completely lost my train of thought. Um, what, no, but uh, it's almost this, like the like last, he, this he, last he, series of paintings. Um, yeah. well, I also wanted to just add to something that Liz was saying that was really cru like crucial to this kind of like more spiritual aspect and, and not spiritual again, just to be clear, not in like a religious or kind of spiritual or metaphysical way, but in a sense that, um, you know, part of, Alan's process and a lot of artists who have inspired me were going through the unknown, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that is the ability to take risks, but the ability mm -hmm. to night after night, like if you have a routine and you go to have a workout, you know how many reps you're going to do and you're working your muscles or mm -hmm. doing your training or, you know, there's a plan, there's a, there's a system. You're not going in there and be like, whoa, I didn't know I was going to bench 250. I mean, yeah, maybe, but you I remember what I was going to say now that you're saying this. <laughs> go ahead. So, Sorry. Um, so, so the thing when you're going through the unknown, you know, night after night when he was doing those drawings or when he was going in there making those sounds, you're you're working through time and space to get something you've never heard before by going through the unknown. I mean, mm -hmm. and to produce what Alan produced and the the power and the you know the kind of tapping into the human condition while and also speaking into the unconscious. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, that really that, led him on this crazy path, you know. Sorry, but that, that was the point I was going to make because, again, this is something that Alan would say. So he was feeling it and, and from what I was observing and what, what we all observe about the end product. He would say that when he starts either a painting or a piece of music or whatever it might be, you might have a conscious intention going in. And as Jared said, with the athlete, there's definitely conscious intention because they need to they know what their training program is. But with Alan, it was he would say that you might start and then the work itself, the piece itself starts to become. And you're almost like the vessel that the energy mm -hmm. is moving through to re realize what it's supposed to be kind of thing. If that, if that doesn't sound too wacky, but it's almost like magic. And I saw many times in the studio where we would be hours and hours and hours and he has an idea like he knows that there's something that he's meant to find sonically or whatever. And we could be working and nothing seems to be clicking. And then all of a sudden it can go from sounding like a total cacophony of what, what the heck is this? And then suddenly the magic goes without any conscious knowing of what it is that what happened, but then suddenly, and we'll look at each other and go, holy shit. Wow. <laughs> and, 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 and it's normally, it tends to be way more interesting than what you would have had in mind right. in, in a more purposeful way. Yes. It, it tends to be, yes, exactly. And um, that was the beauty. That was the, and another thing Alan used to say, and I love saying this because I feel like I learned so much from him and I'm so grateful for that. And I think what Jared and I were able to do and what I was able to bring to the table, Jared is way more technically 
proficient than me, even though I mixed albums with Alan and he gave me co-producing credit and co-writing credit. But technically, Jared is super proficient. But I learned so many things from Alan just in terms of how you approach creativity. And he used to always say there are no mistakes. And if you can free yourself up by recognizing that there are no mistakes, like give yourself over to the universe. You know, yes, you're going at it and you have some ideas and you want to be able to just explore those ideas. But if you also feel that there's no mistakes, and again, it's that there's nothing really on the line because I don't need to, I can, again, live on the refrigerator, on the Bowery in a refrigerator box. You know what I'm saying? So that also really is that creative freedom is very difficult to get as an artist, especially in today's world where it's, it's not valued unless you're plugging into some machine that's cranking out a bunch of product. And so to be able to create without having to necessarily think about the machine while you're creating um, is a beautiful thing. And I think again, that that whole concept of there's no mistakes and things can happen seemingly randomly. And yet there's a method to the madness because you do, you're coming at it with a certain intention, right? To find something special. And I think sometimes the intention alone can really help you get there. And then at a certain point, you just, you know, that's where the other stuff comes into play. Yes. And, and when it comes to the, the as collaborators with, between, and this is a question for you, Liz, and for you, Jared, uh, what united you as, as, as creative collaborators? Uh, uh, it strikes me that maybe... Um, there, there was something more of, uh, how can I say it? Uh, with, with, it strikes me as maybe similar to, to, to probably the collaboration he had with Martin uh, Rev for Suicide, um, something where, where he was relying on others for the more technical or the more practical side of these creations. Maybe in this case, uh, um, uh, the day-to-day -day activities that take you to create an album. Was there such thing? What, what was the nature of, of what brought you together as creators? What, what did he have that you didn't and what you had that he didn't? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a really good question. For me personally, it was more of the, initially more of the practical. He's thinking there are all these machines and there are keyboards and we're going to try to create all these sounds. And Liz is a drummer. She's got a good sense of rhythm. Bring her in and let's see what we do. And, and of course, me being, an, I was an attorney on Wall Street at the time, but I was playing drums in, band, in punk bands. So I already had that creative side to me that was not being fully explored and utilized. So I was able to go in and help facilitate. In fact, the first, the, our engineer who we worked with for 30 years was someone who is the engineer and owner of the studio that my band used to rehearse at. And he was a really cool laid back guy. So I figured with Alan's more intense energy, this super laid back chill guy might be a great combination. And we ended up working at his recording, Perkin Barnes at 6A Studios for the next, you know, eight albums and almost 30 years. Um, so yes, there was for me, but again, as I said, once I got in there with him, it freed me up because I came from a place where logical reasoning and structured and, you know, on the, on the right side of my brain versus the left side of the brain kind of thing. Well, that, what I would love is with Alan was an opportunity to be totally creative. And again, that, that freedom of whatever, there's no mistakes and, and things happen. And then it was, it was just amazing. And then with respect to working with Jared and I'll let Jared speak to this um, further but we had done a collaboration on a split single and I had gone into it. At this point, this was after Alan had had a stroke. So we weren't going into the studio as much. He was working more on his visual art. Um, but we had, we knew we had a ton of stuff in, in the, what we call now call the vault, um, but that had been recorded that hadn't been released. So they wanted something that hadn't been released. So Alan says, why don't you go and take a listen with Perkin and see what's in there? And I was, first of all, I was really surprised at, how much material was in there. And then I just zoomed in on a particular track and I said to Perkin, let's just take a run at mixing this today. And so we did. And I brought it back and played it for Alan. And he's like, holy shit, that sounds great. And then he said to me, whoa, we, we must have a ton of stuff in the Vega vault. He like dubbed it the Vega vault. And then he said, because he would always joke this way. He said, so after I'm gone, Feel free to go in and do whatever you want with it. This kind of thing. <laughs> I so, love I love the Vega Vault. The Vega Vault. <laughs> Amazing, right? Yeah. But if it weren't for Jared asked saying, Hey, you know, do you guys have any unreleased stuff? We could do a split single together. I wouldn't have gone in and done that. And I wouldn't have said, you know what? 
Alan's probably not going to be able to get in here right away. So let me just take a run at mixing it. And then I bring it back. And he had that ultimate confidence in me that, wow, you kept it true to my vision, right? Because I'd been mixing things with him before. Yes. And I know what he likes. So I wouldn't do something really crazy that wouldn't be his thing. And so the fact that he was able to say, wow, that sounds great. Holy shit, that's great. There must be a lot of other stuff like that that we never even released that's really cool. And as he said in an interview once, the two people whose judgment I trust on my music are Rick Ocasek and Liz. So he said, having said that to me today, that day, and knowing how much he respected Jared and felt Jared really, as we would say, Jared really gets it. So after he did pass, knowing I had his blessing to go in and release more material and knowing Jared, Jared was the one I reached out to, to, to master it, which was the final album that we had mixed and produced and finished. But Jared worked alongside me, making sure that the mastering was on point and was so diligent. And so his ears are so good. And so when it came time to like release more stuff from the vault, Alan would have handpicked Jared, you know, hands down. There's no question. So that's how we got to the point where we worked together on Mutator. And and when it comes uh, to particularly you, Jared, uh, when when it comes to uh, describing, uh, maybe give me maybe if there's like three, four, even five qualities that that you think are the ones that really. Uh, made you qualified, right? Or or or, or connected you? What, what are the principles? The, the, these principles that you guys you guys share. Maybe they were unspoken principles, but maybe if you can put them in words, uh, what were the things that 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 um, made you or someone like uh, Rico Kasich or or Liz uh, that that these these shared unspoken values uh, that that would give you that trust into the, the Vega vault, you know, and understand it and, and do something or mix something or pick something that will represent those, those common share values. Um, well, I can try. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, beyond bringing my own like artistic sensibilities and instincts to my own work or any project. And especially with Alan's, you know, someone I revered, I mean, someone whose records made me want to make records you know, and then hopefully continue that you know for other future generations i think above all music is a language and what makes a producer great is how you can connect the pieces uh from the blueprints into a cohesive whole and with alan's music and i've been thinking about this a lot lately because liz and i are working on some more uh vega vault material and um, something that really struck me struck me was how Alan's music is like a like an engine. Like you take a car engine, right? You know, Tesla, whatever. I don't, you know, I don't even know. I've never looked inside the Tesla engine, but at, at any like a car engine, a well-made car engine, and there are certain pieces that kind of go together. Um, and when I'm working on Alan's music with Liz, I imagine or or, or am guided towards. So, these sounds that that Alan put together, and it's sort of like guiding all the pieces to that that kind of fit, right? So it's like the engine kind of elevates or levitates above. Just bear with me on this analogy for a second. This engine kind of lifts up out of the car and separates, and then you've got all of Alan's sounds. And then there's something, you know, with Alan being gone, and there's kind of feeling his presence here as if he's in the room. It's like he's helping or you know, I'm channeling him or feeling his presence to kind of guide those pieces together. And then it's like a gravitational pull where they all snap together and go back into the car. And I feel like that, I guess to boil it down in one word is intuition, you mm -hmm. know? And I just, I can't tell you why I get Alan's music or when I listen to Suicide or any of his records that I, f there's like a feel, there's an emotional response and a feeling I get. And this, um, thing that really drives me in my own work with the vacant lots and my own you know any records i produce is just kind of keeping the ins that your in your personal or artistic sensibilities and your artistic instincts and intuition true and 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 being re and, and keeping that really real and intact and i think that approach honesty in the music beyond whether like if you know something's good when it's good you know which rick okasic told me when i asked him like how the fuck did 
you know, this pop star from the cars work with Suicide, the like grittiest, meanest fucking punk, you know, like revolutionary punk band. And, and Rick was just like, if it's good, it's good. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and they built a, a relationship. And I think for, you know, my relationship with Alan was just kind of this like prime. He OK, let me just put it to you in a different way. Um, I like cut my hand open on stage um, and had to get like nine stitches in London um, and, uh, and, and, and some stitches on my arm and I was bleeding everywhere. And I was like so proud of all the blood that I shed on stage, yes, you know, like I'm that's... up there with Iggy and Alan and fucking, it's this, like, on. yeah. And the sex pistols. And I'm like, Oh man, I can't wait to show like every fucking person I show those photos to thought like I should go to a mental institution, you know, my <laughs> family, my friends, other artists, they're like, you're fucking cracked. You're, you're mental. The only person I show those photos to who like got it on another level was Alan. He's like, man, that's fucking beautiful. You were like going to bleed for the, for the right? you know, yeah, and I just, I, I think it's just kind of like, you know, what guides you through the music and there's the mm -hmm. instincts and your intuition and, you know, and I think those, if you, if you stay true to that and, and I'm really lucky to have, you know, a collaborative partner like Liz too, because it's like, you know, it's the unspoken thing where we both look at each other and we just know like this mm -hmm. is this is it here it is it's, it's, it strikes me as as uh there's there's two sides of it that you have to have an understanding and and one of them is is uh the beauty in tragedy the beauty uh, behind every dark uh theme or or moment right that uh alan uh seems to to capture well, and that comes more from the the color, the spirit. But then, uh, when you were saying about uh, the the engine, the uh, analogy, uh, the first thing I started to think was that uh, well, if you think about it, he did early on in his life uh, study astrophysics, right? Exactly. So, so you're you're talking about someone that is somewhat mechanically minded, uh, mm -hmm. meaning that he's thinking about uh, the mechanisms of the cosmos, and 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 he ended up kind of doing that in his music instead of uh, understanding the instead of studying the, the mechanisms of the cosmos he did it through 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 uh, through music and 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 to find uh this this mechanical work this this engineering or, or architecture behind his pieces maybe is is, is 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 in relation to that that he was somewhat mechanically minded when when building these things but also uh, all under that color of uh, the beauty in in the darkness the beauty in the tragedy of things yeah actually i was actually i love that really great you said that because mm -hmm. i was going to say like how you know in addition to the the mechanical aspect of the music there's something really transformative and it's a and i think you know mutator especially was about balancing a dark vision with hope mm -hmm. and i mean exactly. and that's that a really theme that runs through all of his works with whether with suicide or solo there's there's that duality of beauty and brutality because it's not just you know pie in the sea we, we don't just have our rose colored glasses on there's there's so much beauty but there's also a recognition that that life is no joke life is can be hard and there can be a lot of um pain and and brutality but but again that there's that hope there yeah. um I, I also just wanted to speak to like just the process of producing and you, you talk about rick okasic and i think what jared and i are able to do that rick also was able to do is and Rick is somebody who you know can do very, very polished, beautiful work, but he had the ability to keep the soul of yeah. what Alan's message was. And there was a, there was a there was a timelessness again to everything that Alan did because because of that soulfulness. The the other thing that was important in terms of our what makes it more challenging for us is this is not music that we're you know using preset you know sounds and every sound on every track is something that was manipulated and morphed and mutated over yeah. you know many 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 different iterations to get to that ultimate sound and then you start layering those sounds and alan's sensibility was a little bit more toward and this is why when we would be producing together and, and alan and i and mixing i would be i would always want to hear the differentiation of sound because there were so many interesting sounds and i'd be like i want to and I'd be like, put let's put compression on this so we could hear this cut through and now of course there's there's a lot technology allows you to get 
enhance those sounds. We're not changing them, but we're allowing the space so you can actually hear all the stuff that's going on. And it's really deep. There's a lot of cool stuff happening. So Jared and I are able to do that, keep the uniqueness of the sounds, but bring it to light. And Alan would have loved that. We just didn't really have the wherewithal, you know, and so we're keeping it alive. We're keeping the soul and yet we're enhancing the sound so people can appreciate it. And what we're also doing that Alan would have loved is about, when you're talking about his legacy, he was very grateful. He did feel that sense of, he knew he inspired many people. He wasn't selling a ton of record albums, but to him it was more important to have that young artist or seasoned artist come up to him and say, I wouldn't have done music if it weren't for you. And he would like it even more if what they were doing is completely different from what he was doing. It was the the, the pure message of I inspired you to be creative. To him, that was the greatest success. That was the greatest gift. So for us now, in terms of preserving and enhancing enhancing Alan's legacy. It's about, we just want people to hear this because mm -hmm. it inspires more people to be creative and to say, Hey, you know, this is an important outlet. It's not just about paying the bills. There's, there's, you know, we're all on this planet and it's can, life can be hard and, but life can also be beautiful. And some of that joy and beauty comes out of the act of creating. And that's the underlying message here. So, so our mission is really to get Alan's work heard by more people because we yeah. feel that that's a really big gift and, and we really do feel honored to be able to do that and so that's really important and i know and one of the reasons that jared you initially asked why is jared um well suited for this alan, alan knew and going back to all the conversations they had alan at one point said i'm passing the baton or the torch i'm passing the torch to jared because he knew that he understood and his sensibilities and just, just when we started working together, as Jared said, there's that unspoken thing. We're like on the same page and yet we have that checks and balances too. So we're not yeah. like, because we could get our own, we're each creative being <laughs> ourselves. So we could get ahead of ourselves and, and that might be for another project where we're yeah. just doing some of the sounds from the vault, but we collaborate with another artist and we do something completely different. But when it comes to an Alan Vega pro project, we are making absolutely sure that Alan is sitting right there with us. And yeah, you can feel him with yeah, us. Man. Like in the yeah, man, that's great. Like when I came <laughs> home with that first track, he's like, holy shit, that sounds great. You know, that same thing. That's what. That's our mission. That's kind of the, the yeah. parameters that we're working in when we're working on an Alan Vega product. Because people will say that, oh, you know, it wasn't mixed by Alan. I'm like, excuse me, motherfuckers. I was there for 30 years with Alan. I think, yeah, anyone who's sensing, qualified to run I know. I exactly. Know. And if I didn't, <laughs> Alan would be right up there saying, he sent me right. signals. He sent us so many signals. We believe in that energy is still there and he's yeah. still yeah. Much with us. Yeah. Even and just something he would be proud of, you know, like for me, yeah. that's like the number totally. one driving thing. But like, because... And happy that more people are hearing it. And again, it's not about the paycheck. It's about... Holy shit, people are hearing my stuff. Dream Baby Dream was used, uh, it was a cover version by Karen O in the World Series. Now, Alan, you talk about athletes. Alan, as a young man, as a young boy, was a great baseball player. He swam, he was a lifeguard. People don't realize this about him. What they also don't realize about him is he was an avid sports fan. He could remember every team, every player, stats, blah, 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 blah. And I come from Boston where my family's like really into sports. I actually am in a competitive boxer still and I manage professional fighters. Alan, he thought athletes were artists, like tremendous artists. So he would have loved that analogy. Um, but, at, at, you know, it's like, I've again, I completely forgot my <laughs> where I was going with this. But, um, yeah. No, no, but uh, we're just I, working on the producing and the music yeah, and yeah. how, you know, but he's something that he would be proud of as well. You know, well, I think right, that's right. The whole idea and connecting of, it with other people. Right. Not doing it for the paycheck, but doing it like for like, yeah, again, inspiring more people. And he believed this stuff is timeless. He used yeah. to say that all the time about suicide. We weren't ahead of our time. We were just right where we were in time. And what is time? You know, time is a construct. And we're still in what, so what he's doing, it's so funny when people say like, oh, this was done and da, da, da. It didn't matter. It didn't matter what decade. The stuff yeah. he was doing in, in the 90s, it's crazy. Jared's, we're listening to the stuff now I mean, for this next so stuff. It's so relevant. It's crazy. Holy shit. It's intense. It's crazy. It sounds like it could have been made like, you know, two weeks ago. Yeah. Or, so or 30 crazy. years from now on Mars. And I think that's something that Liz and I were, we've really 
you know, as much as we use restraint, you know, because we want to like honor his music and, and, and manifest his vision, you know, and not put like our spin on it. But we, you know, we're able to make the music modern. So it sounds like of today, which really goes in correspondence with his, you know, universal and timelessness in his music, you know, like records sound like they do in the 90s from the 90s for a certain the technology or the engineers or the producers or whatever and also was, because they were using the same machines and basically going right. to what get out of the machine pretty quickly yeah. and alan used to say that he's like whatever i'm getting out of the machine pretty quickly first of all i don't even want to look at the manual because i want i don't want to have any idea how to actually get sound out of this thing yes so we're going in blind and then if you hear some that's something that you, then you have to manipulate it then it goes through something else then you morph it through something else and then you layers so you, by the time you finish People would be like, well, where did this sound come from? So that also is it doesn't have a time stamp. Yeah. Whereas you can mm -hmm. hear, I mean, you know, diff different periods, people are using the popular, whatever's, you know, different machines become popular. And you can kind of hear it. Oh, that was Planet Fat from 1996. You know, whatever, you know what I mean? But you would <laughs> never be able to airmark that with what Alan was doing because he yeah. just kept morphing it. And just one other thing I'll add. Um, you know, as you can see, we both get really excited and yeah. kind of emotional and speaking about this because it's not just like, oh, these are just songs, you know, here's some chords yeah. and this is the verse and chorus. It's like, here's the start, here's the end. But I think the the approach and ability to put so much human and humanity through mm -hmm. the machines and through electronic music mm -hmm. to make it sound so, you know, uh, you know, unelectronic. Exactly. And, and human, I think, is... The blood is pumping through that heart. Yeah. That, that is one of the, the, the big uh, challenges, I think, with the electronic music, and he yeah. was so successful at that. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And what he would say, too, which, which really rings true, is no matter what I did, suicide, Alan Vega solo, art, visual... My fingerprint is all over. You you can see. Yeah. That's why I laugh when when you know because some people you know you get people on the internet saying like you know how is this why is this a legitimate Alan Vega he's not here da 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 his fingerprints are all over this thing you, oh, you know yes. it's like, yeah yeah it's like yeah. It's undeniable. That's great. Well, uh, I, I really look forward to to more things coming from the Vega Vault uh, and what you know. I want to, you know, getting to 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 know an artist that even uh, way past his his passing, uh, there's still more to be discovered and to be understood. And even uh, just as much as I've been listening to Suicide since uh, the mid '90s, when when I discovered them, uh, I I thought I knew him in some way, and today I come out uh, uh, knowing a different kind of Alan Vega that uh, I, I suspected in some ways, and there's some pleasant surprises that I didn't know about like uh, sports for example yeah. uh, but uh, but no but but really seriously just uh, I'm, I'm I'm really excited on 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 what uh, you Liz and Jared uh, continue to to bring out from from his uh, work and uh, and to to know that it's in in good hands uh, and and hopefully uh, continue on this uh, cosmic conversation that he started uh, many years ago that's well, thanks a lot, man. Just honored to be a part of this. You know, Thank you, Alejandro. This legacy alive. Yeah. I just want to say one, one further thing. I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me and Jared to thank us, but to say I needed to hear Alan's voice. Yeah. So the fact that there's so much more there, that he's still giving that gift. Yes. I love it. It's just so important. We're on a mission. So yes. <laughs> Yeah. We're on a mission. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been so wonderful talking to to you, Liz, and to you, Jared. Thank you so much for your time and sharing uh, so candidly all these stories, all these ideas, and and really, uh, I think you you allowed me to to in a way uh, explore myself a bit more uh, uh, what this all means. Uh, so thank you hey, so much. Hey, thanks a lot. I think Alan would have liked to hear that too. So Absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.